Okay, hello everyone, Simon here, and welcome back to our ArcMind 100 series where we're learning architectural concepts through Minecraft. So this is going to be lecture number 8, and it's going to be about infrastructure. So architects usually don't get involved with infrastructure, but it's very important in terms of uh, urban design, city planning. I mean, everybody uses infrastructure, so you kind of need, need to know about it. Uh, in order to design things around it. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you're the sort of architect who gets involved with, with infrastructure, maybe that too. Alright, so what is infrastructure? Infrastructure refers to the systems that provide people with the necessities they need to survive. Uh, that picture there is the Ontario Highway 401 in Canada. I think that's supposed to be the busiest highway in Canada. Um, it doesn't look like it at that point because I think it was closed for, for something, I don't know what it was closed for, but... So there was an interesting point where they took a photo when the highway was closed, but otherwise it'd be full of cars. Uh, so infrastructure includes things like transportation, food supply, water supply, sewage systems, energy supply, and also communications, and sometimes people consider government institutions and kind of social... Uh, social things and cultural cultural institutions and sports facilities also as infrastructure. I guess they call, they call them soft infrastructure, so things like, you know, museums and art galleries and sports stadiums. I mean, they're not, you know, actual, you know, they, they don't kind of provide, for example, food or water or transport or electricity or anything like that, but, you know, people you still use them. Um, whether or not you consider that to be infrastructure is, you know, it, it's a matter of interpretation, but those things are also necessary in cities and in societies. So first of all, let's start with transportation. Uh, roads are pretty much the oldest and most basic form of transport infrastructure. So this picture here is of a Roman street from Pompeii. If you don't know, Pompeii was a Roman town that got buried by a volcano eruption. and Everybody, everybody died, that, that, that kind of sucks, but the good part to come out of that was that because the whole town was buried like very quickly, it was preserved, and the, the, the volcanic ash kind of did a very good job of preserving the town, so when they kind of dug the town back up, everything was pretty much in place. So that was useful for us in terms of understanding how the Romans lived. Uh, it was a bad time for the Romans who lived there because they got killed by the uh, volcano. But here's a, here's a road, or a, a street, from Pompeii. And you can see the, the stone paving there, providing the surface for their horses and chariots. Uh, you can't really see it there, but in some roads in Pompeii, you can like see the grooves in the road where the chariots had kind of worn the stone so much that they, they would wear grooves into the, the stone. So that was, it was very interesting because you can see exactly you know, what kind of vehicles they had as well because of the, you know, the, the wheel marks in the stone. So roads improve speed and comfort of foot, of foot animal and road vehicle traffic. So basically if you have a, a hard surface to walk on, you can move more quickly and more comfortably. I mean, if you, if you try to walk through the mud, you know that it's not a good thing. Whereas if you walk on the road or you, if you drive on the road, it's, it's much more easy than driving in the grass, for example. So that, that sort of thing is pretty straightforward. And But, you know, on a, at, a, at a larger scale, it also improves trade, military mobility, and communications. So, you know, because people can travel more quickly and more comfortably, trade is improved, for example, because trade is all about moving goods from one place, one place to another to, to, you know, to exchange them for other goods, right? So in order for trade to happen, you need, you need transport. And in order for transport to happen, you need decent roads. Otherwise, you know, you can't... I mean, imagine if, you, if it takes you a year to go from point A to point B, you can't carry very much. You know, you spend a long time getting there, whereas if you can get there in a day, then it's very easy to, to move a lot of goods from point A to point B, right? So that is useful. And uh, so recently, the widespread adoption of automobiles has been accompanied by widespread world building as well, especially in the United States. In the post-war period, in the post-Second World War period, there's been a lot of building of highways. I guess all around the world there's been building of highways, but 
the United States is kind of notable for just how many roads there are. So a typical American city has over a third of the surface area as roads. So just think about that for a moment, right? When you think about a city, you don't really think, oh, it's roads. But when you think about a city, you think about skyscrapers, you think about buildings, you think about landmarks, maybe even mountains. But you don't, well, you know, mountains and harbors and lakes and rivers, you don't really think about roads being the city. But it's true. In the, in the typical American city, over a third of the surface area of the city is roads. I mean, there's a road outside every house, you know, there's a, there's a road outside every building, and then there's, you know, between smaller roads, there's even bigger roads called highways. So there's a lot of roads in cities. It actually takes up a lot of space. And that's, that's just how important transportation is and how important movement is. Uh, you can have roads bridging over water or valleys. Bridges are, of course, useful because you can have a road cross the water, right? It uh, costs significantly more than roads on the ground, and it's also more technically challenging. This is a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. But you know, if you if you kind of if you're careful about where you place your bridges, you can greatly reduce travel time. For example, here in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, spanned over the the mouth of San Francisco Bay. So San Francisco is on like a peninsula where it's got water on three sides. And as the city grew, it kind of got constrained by the fact that it was surrounded by water. So they bridged over here to the north, and so then allowed the city to expand northwards out of the uh, out of the tight peninsula there. And it also has other bridges going east and across the harbor, and then so the San Francisco is no longer you know just stuck on the peninsula. But you know having these having these bridges allowed the city to continue to grow, and that's very important. And uh, yeah, like bridges everywhere. I mean, if you don't have the bridges, you basically have to get on a boat to get across the water and then get off the boat again. It's just not convenient. And it, and convenient also sort of means it's it's not timely. Like, it costs more money to get there. It takes more time to get from point A to point B. So, you know, in a, in a lot of highly populated areas, bridges are very useful and definitely cost-effective even it, though it might cost a lot of money to build a bridge like this. Uh, the other option, of course, is to tunnel. Tunnels allow roads and other transport networks to travel underground, obviously. I'm sure you understand that already. Uh, usually they're used as shortcuts through mountains, or they're used to tunnel underwater. So this example here is the Channel Tunnel entrance on the French side. The Channel Tunnel goes underneath the English Channel between France and England. So it's a pretty big waterway and they tunnel through that. And tunnels are even more expensive to build than bridges because you actually have to dig through the ground. Uh, but And so the costs have to be, be weighed carefully against the economic benefits. So purely from a transport point of view, like, you know, just kind of moving goods back and forth from point A to point B, you know, when you're building a tunnel because it's cost so much money, you really have to kind of decide whether or not it's worth the money to do that. So this the channel tunnel under the English Channel, it, it's a train tunnel, but it is integrated with the road network via car and truck carrying trains. So the trains are designed so that you can just drive your car onto the train, and then the train will go through the tunnel, and then you just drive your car back off the train on the other side. So it's integrated with the road network in that way, otherwise it's a train tunnel. The channel tunnel, it's, uh, it's, it, like, it's economically, it's a little bit dubious. I think it's the, 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 uh, the accounting for now is that it's, it barely covers the cost of, like the benefits of the tunnel barely covers the cost of building it. So it's, you know, like, it's kind of it's convenient to be able to just kind of drive onto the train and just kind of go across to France very quickly. But whether or not it's cost effective is, is not really clear at this point. Maybe barely cost effective. So, you know, because it's so expensive to build. Uh, moving on to other types of transport. This is a port. This is the port of Shanghai. I think at the moment, the single busiest port in the world. It used to be the port of Singapore that used to be the biggest port or the, the busiest port in the world. 
Uh, ports and harbors serve ships. Harbors provide shelter from rough seas, while ports unload and unload cargo and passengers. So you can see the containers there, and you see the cranes in the background that loads all these containers onto the ships and off the ships. Ships are the most economical way to transport large quantities of cargo, but the transport speeds are relatively slow. Uh, ships have always been the most economical way to transport large amounts of cargo. Just because when you're floating in the water and then you can move very easily. In the past, you, there were sailing ships, so even the uh, the the energy was free. Like you just kind of catch the wind to get from one continent to the other. Uh, so it, it was. It, I mean, it's the most co most cost effective way to move heavy cargo because you just float on the water and just float where you need. And it continues to be the case today that you know the massive container ships that travel between you know, the continents, are uh, the, uh, the main way we move freight around. We don't travel, like people don't travel that way because it's not very fast. But cargo certainly does. And oh, and port cities are very important. Like port cities are often the most prosperous and most important cities in the world. Like Shanghai, like London used to be, like uh, Singapore, like New York for a long time. It was the main port into the United States, for example. So port cities are, are always important. Uh, canals are channels of water dug through land to enable ships to travel through. This is the Suez Canal in Egypt. There's two really big or well, really important canals in the world. The one in Panama, which is between North and South America, and the one in Suez, which is between the the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, right? Um, aside from the major kind of major canal routes on the trade routes of the world, there's also cities like Venice and, and Amsterdam, which has extensive canal networks. Uh, from So they provided transportation from before there were cars. So if you kind of, I don't know if you've been to Venice or Amsterdam, but there's like canals everywhere, and so instead of streets for roads, for cars, they would have canals for ships or you know for for small boats, because that was the the more convenient way to to transport people around the city is is using boats in the canal network rather than in cars, in cars on the road network because there weren't any cars back then. But, you know, again, canals are quite expensive to build because you literally have to dig a channel and then flood it with water, right? And today, yeah, the, the important canals today are the ones that link the major shipping routes where the container ships kind of go around the world. Is there anything else to say about canals? No, that's, that should be it. I should probably have put a picture of Venice or Amsterdam in here. Just for... You can look it up on Wikipedia or something and just kind of see the extensive canal networks in those cities. And that that's you know precisely because shipping was so important throughout history before cars were invented. Uh, beginning in the early 19th century, trains greatly improved land transport. So before trains were invented, it was very difficult to move cargo on land because you had to have horses or oxen or other animals kind of pull carriages or just kind of carry goods like camel trains or like you know, you know like kind of teams of camels carrying goods on their backs so animal labor while it was useful it was limited but with the invention of the steam engine and kind of putting that on wheels and train tracks trains could transport passengers and cargo much more cheaply and also much more quickly than animal drawn carriages so all of a sudden you know whereas before you know, the port cities were important be because, you know, shipping was so important. But suddenly the trains allowed a lot of inland cities to be connected to the trade networks and then for the transport to become, uh, you know, useful enough for inland cities to also just join up with the, uh, with the, train network, with the trade networks. Uh, trains are confined to train tracks. But, um, you know, train tracks are relatively easy to build, and so very quickly, once a train was invented, train tracks would be built between the major cities around the world. The large capacity of trains necessitate large stations for loading and unloading them, because trains 
trains are the the bulk transport. Like the the train engine is very powerful. I mean, there's no point using a train to carry one person. It's always long trains, and it's always kind of hundreds of people. Even short trains, you'd expect to carry like several dozen up to several hundred people. Because you know the the, the, the trains are like they, they scale that way. The engines are so strong that you know you don't, it doesn't make sense to carry few people. So you often the train stations are quite large, and they would handle thousands up to a million people a day, and that's not really that's not even uncommon in uh, in busy cities. This is the Beijing railway station. This is the back of it. So the front of it is quite interesting architecturally, but it doesn't show you the train tracks. The back of it is just like a mass of train tracks and 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 the overhead electrical wires, which I mean it's probably kind of complicated to try and figure out all of this. But there's a lot of platforms, and all the tracks kind of branch out into the different platforms because the train station is designed to handle so many people. Uh, you can't see the actual architecture of the train station here, but you see the, the mass of tracks. The newest form of transportation is the airplane. And airplanes are served by airports. This is the Hong Kong International Airport, the new one. It's mostly a, a big flat piece of ground with, um, with runways and a terminal, I guess. So they provide facilities for loading and unloading passengers and cargo from airplanes. I guess the most yeah the most important feature of of the airport is the runway because the the planes require a long flat straight stretch of of land to to build up enough speed to get into the air right. So the runways are the main feature here, but also the terminals because in a busy airport you have many many aircraft every day. Kind of coming in to pick up and, and unload passengers, so the the terminals become rather complicated and crowded, with a lot of different planes and a lot of different people coming and going at the same time. So logistically quite complicated, but if you look at it, you know from up here it's just pretty much big and flat because the the planes need to land right, they need to come down and land, so you can't have tall buildings in the way. So it's usually just a really large flat area. And airports are typically because they they need such a, a large area for for lane for planes to land and and take off, and also because of the noise from the airplanes, like they they they're quite loud as they come in and land or or taking off, so they're usually placed far away from well not that far away but like out of, out on the outskirts of the cities, because you don't want kind of planes flying past your buildings all the time because it's so noisy. And there's always the danger of a plane crashing into into the city. So, typically, the airports are built out in the open and uh, on the outskirts of the city. And so then they also have to be connected to the existing road and rail networks, so that you know people can get off the plane, get on a train, go to the city or something in a convenient manner. Uh, here, the Hong Kong International Airport, you can see that it's on an island surrounded by water. And that also improves the safety too, because if if a plane is is crashing, or it misses the runway, then it's safer for it to fall in the water than it is to fall on land, because you know the land is hard and the water is soft. So you know if a, if a plane has to crash, it's it's a little bit safer to crash into the water. So having the the airport on an, on an island like this is probably better than on land. Although you know if it falls in the water, you need to rescue people quickly, or they all drown in the water. That's not good neither. Anyway, let's not talk about plane crashing. Moving on to food, most pa uh, farms and pastures are relatively unremarkable. Usually, it's just a large, flat piece of land that's open just to the sun and rain, because that's what crops need to grow, right? You just need sun and water, and then the stuff grows. Sometimes, mechanical farming and irrigation systems will result in distinctive patterns on the farmland. For example. There's rows of corn, or you can find circular fields because they use pivot irrigation. Basically, there's a there's like a carriage thing that spins around the center point, and it waters the field. And because it, it's a pivot irrigation system, the, the the field is circular because the irrigation system is circular. So that that's kind of interesting. But other than that, it, most farms are kind of boring. It's just kind of big open flat areas of land. 
in parts of the world where flat land is less common, sometimes you see uh, terracing, like you see in this picture here. This is terraced rice fields in Vietnam. So in order to retain water and reduce uh, erosion, they would terrace, they would cut terraces into the hills, and then plant on the flat terraces. So turning a slope into a series of flat surfaces so they can plant on them. So that's kind of interesting from a from just a geometric point of view, but I mean, it's, it's only because they don't have flat land. If they had flat land, they wouldn't be doing that. But they don't have flat land, they only have hills, so they have to do that in the hills. In terms of the, the architecture surrounding food production, it's usually quite utilitarian. Here we have some grain silos in Ohio, United States, and it's just cylinders of grain, and there's a pump that's kind of drops grain into it and then pulls it back out again. So it's, it's very utilitarian and not very decorative. Uh, historically, granaries would be raised off the ground to avoid pests, like you, know, you want to stop insects and animals coming in to eat your grain. So granaries where, where grain and other food might be stored is usually raised above ground and then protected from the, the wind and the rain. But otherwise, it would just be like a like a hut, except there's no windows because it's just used to store food. So yeah, so so kind of food storage facilities are typically not that interesting to look at. They're very functional though. Uh, these days, we have things called intensive farming. This is a chicken house in Florida, in Florida, in USA. That's a lot of chickens in not a very big space. So intensive farming or factory farming is basically high-density animal husbandry and crop farming. The idea is to pack as many f animals or plants into as small, well not as small a space as possible, but to, but to absolutely maximize the, the food yield from the area you have available. So the feed, the lighting, and the ambient environment is carefully controlled to maximize food production from animals. Like in some instances, like they would use lights to to kind of speed up egg laying cycles. So chickens, for example, would lay eggs, would lay like one egg a day, but then they would kind of put chickens in these chicken houses and then set the time on the lights so that the lights are actually not on a twenty four hour cycle. They might be on a twenty twenty two or twenty one or twenty hour cycle, so that it gets light and dark, light and dark, but it's artificial, right? But it's faster than the 24-hour day, so then the chicken, they lay one egg a day, but because the, the, the day-night cycle has been artificially tampered with, they lay eggs faster because of that. So it messes up the animals a little bit, to be honest, but it produces more food in less time. And then the point of intensive farming is to try to produce as much food as possible, sometimes at the expense of animal welfare, and then I guess, you know, people are, some people disagree with this sort of thing, and, and I, I don't, you know, I don't argue against that, but on the other hand, this does increase food production, and there's a lot of people in the world that needs food, right? So, I don't know. It seems like a it's a no-win situation, right? Do you, do you want food, or do you want to treat the animals nice? For plants, though, technologies include things like hydroponics and vertical farms. The idea is similar, although people are less concerned about you know plants than they are about animals. So with hydroponics, instead of putting plants in soil, you put plants in water that has nutrients dissolved into it and you know the science is that it's more efficient, like the plants can kind of grab nutrients out of the water more efficiently than it does out of the soil. Or you know even there's even kind of just kind of air farming. I don't know what, what it's called, there might be a trademark name for it. But instead of hydroponics where the, the roots are just in water, the roots are just in air, and then there's, the, I, I, I've seen that they, they kind of put a, a mist onto the roots. So instead of putting the roots in water, they just kind of blow a mist onto the, the roots. And the mist, of course, has nutrients in it. And so it's, it's even more weird than hydroponics, because there's not, in, not only is there no soil, there's not even water, really. It's just kind of mist. But it's really efficient. And then, they, again, they adjust the lighting so that you maximize the amount of kind of photosynthesis having, happening with the plants and then you can kind of get a lot, lot of crops growing very quickly but it's all very artificial right so it's kind of weird 
in that way. But you know, maximizing food production, and that's how people do it today. Those chickens look so sad. Look at them. They've got bits of feathers missing and everything. They're just sad chickens. But they'll be dead soon, and then they'll be on your dinner table. So there you go. Moving on to water. Water is, of course, very important. People need fresh water to drink, but also for hygiene purposes. Uh, they're often supplied locally from lakes, rivers, wells, or rainfall. But once you have a large city, then these sources tend to become outstripped very quickly. And large cities today will typically have reservoirs and aqueduct. Aqueducts. So you have reservoirs collecting water from somewhere out in the wilderness, well, at least on the outskirts of the cities, to, to avoid pollution. And then you have modern aqueducts to bring the water into the city. Uh, when you say aqueduct, usually people think of the old Roman aqueducts, and those are quite um, iconic, I guess. They're like, well, like people imagine like bridges for water, which is basically what the Roman aqueducts are. But in reality, the Roman, even the Roman aqueducts, a lot of it was actually just underground tunnels. They weren't even the bridges. The bridges were rare, and they were of course expensive to build. Here, there's a. This is the Central Arizona Project Canal. The Central Arizona Project is a, a water project to bring water into the uh, the cities. And it's, it's basically like a, an artificial river. They built this canal you know, across the landscape. And a lot of the old Roman aqueducts were like this as well, but they, you know, they're not as interesting to photograph as the bridges. Um, more recently, desalination plants convert seawater to drinking water, so that's a new technology. Uh, using reverse osmosis, I think is the most efficient technology these days. Like this is kind of membranes, you push the seawater through these semi-permeable membranes, and you get uh, fresh water out the other side, and you can trap all the salt. I'm not going to go into the science of it too much, but basically turning seawater into drinkable water, and using that to supply cities. It's energy intensive, but you know seawater is very abundant. And sometimes that's all you can have access to. A lot of yeah, a lot of water infrastructure is underground actually, like pipes underground, so you don't even see them a lot of the time. Sewage, I guess the uh, the other end of water is the sewage. The sewage is literally your crap, and if not disposed of properly, sewage will cause all sorts of pollution and disease, especially in densely populated areas. You can imagine the human effluent is not the healthiest thing to have, you know, accumulating in your house. So the the sewerage system takes all of that away. Uh, in the past, the sewerage was flush. The sewage was flushed directly into rivers or the sea. Like they just kind of dump it, or you know, even worse, people just dump it into the street because I don't know what else would you do with it. So, <laughs> before there were sewer systems and kind of actual infrastructure to take your crap away from your house, people just kind of dumped it in the street in the medieval days. That was terrible. And of course, it led to all sorts of disease and it made the city rather unpleasant to be in. These days, sewage treatment plants um, are very complicated and impressive industrial processes by which the stuff in the sewage, like the, the nasty stuff, is removed, uh, or at least mostly removed, or turned into relatively harmless effluent and sludge. So they use kind of chemical and biological processes to basically detoxify the sewage and turn it into something you can just release in the nature. Basically, it comes out the other end, it's kind of like compost. So it's just not as um, poisonous and, and disease-ridden as it could be. So this sort of stuff is very important. If you don't have it, as we said, uh, you get all sorts of pollution and disease, which is terrible. So moving on to electricity supply. This here is the Mojave Generating Station, a coal power plant. It's, uh, I think it's been decommissioned. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's been decommissioned. It's one of the worst polluting ones in, in the world for a while. So it's, it's an old coal-fired power plant, and it's been decommissioned it's because just how polluting it is. Uh, electricity generation infrastructure depends on the energy source. So 
like this one, the fossil fuel power plants typically have combustion units, smokestacks, and cooling towers. So depending on what fuel you use, the, the, the power generation looks different. Uh, nuclear, nuclear power plants will feature cooling towers and large concrete containment structures. The actual nuclear reactor in the power plants are actually really small. Like the bulk of the, the nuclear power plant that you can see is actually the concrete containment building to try to stop the radiation from coming out if anything goes wrong. So the, like most of it is just kind of safety. The actual reactor is not very big at all. Uh, solar power plants will feature fields of mirrors and solar power towers or fields of photovoltaic panels. So there's two types of solar power. One is the solar thermal power, where you have mirrors reflecting heat from the sun onto a solar power tower, which is basically a, a thing that collects the, the heat and uses it to, to boil water and then use that to drive the turbines, use the steam to drive turbines. So that's just a, a, a you know, so there'll be a, a ring or like a field of mirrors pointing towards a central tower. Or if you're using photovoltaic panels, often on rooftops because they're, they're light. Uh, they'll just be panels and they just sit on, they just sit somewhere open to the sun and turn that into electricity. Hydroelectricity features large dams. <laughs> I mean, there's not much else to say. Large dams and reservoirs too, I guess. So the picture here shows the Three Gorges Dam. I believe at the moment it's the, the, the largest hydroelectric power plant in the entire world. So it's a massive dam that holds the water back and the, the water coming down and then the you know and the speed speed and the weight of the water kind of flowing down from the dam drives the turbine and that generates electricity. So this is a massive dam with a reservoir behind it, right? And that's basically hydroelectricity. Wind farms, I'm sure you've seen them before, they're just a lot of wind turbines. A lot of kind of, typically there's three bladed wind turbines spinning in the air, and a lot of them. Geothermal energy, you might not have seen before, but the most conspicuous feature of geothermal energy is a lot of pipes along the ground, because the, the heat comes out of the ground in different places, and so they would stick pipes down into the ground wherever the heat was coming out, and then they transport the steam and the heat to a, a central power plant and drive the turbines there. So typically in a geothermal energy plant, there'll be just kind of pipes snaking across the landscape, which is really interesting. Uh, aside from electricity generation, there's also the transmission. You see things like this, like tangles of wire. This is an electricity transmission substation. So you find um, a lot of transformers and, and, and switches and electrical equipment kind of just mashed together. Uh, there's also the high voltage cables that you see kind of snaking across the landscape as well. So you kind of have the distinctive steel pylons, right? Holding up wires that stretch across the landscape. So that's the, the visible elements of electricity transmission. Of course, it, uh, cables can be buried underground as well, but that's more expensive than just hanging them in the air. So as you get into the cities, then you don't see those pylons anymore, or you don't see as many of them anymore because they'll be buried in the ground. Coal, oil, and gas. So this is where the uh, the energy comes from, the fossil fuels. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution, fossil fuels have been the major energy source for humanity. Unfortunately, it has some pollution problems and carbon dioxide problems. Uh, this is a an open cast coal mine in China. You can see they just kind of dig a massive hole in the ground and then move all the coal out. Coal mines used to be tunnels in the ground, but these days with with the modern excavation machinery, it's more efficient and more cost effective to actually just dig up all the soil between the surface and the coal to get to the coal and then just dig up all the coal as well. So, so moving all of this dirt has become more cost effective than trying to dig tunnels into the ground. It's kind of crazy if you think about it, but that's how it works. Coal is the most abundant and convenient because it's like a solid fuel 
that you just burn, but it's also the most polluting. It's the most polluting thing you can burn, pretty much. But um, it's very convenient because it's just it's solid fuel. This is a, an offshore oil platform, which is uh, they're, they're drilling for oil out in the ocean. So crude oil and natural gas are extracted from deep underground via drilled wells. Uh, less abundant than coal, but also less polluting. So when you burn this stuff, it's not quite as nasty, although it's still kind of bad. Oil and gas wells tend to be smaller and more engineering intensive than coal mines. The thing is, because oil and gas are, are fluid and, and gaseous, you don't have to like dig up the entire ground to pick up the solid stuff. Like if you drill into the ground, a lot of the stuff will flow, and so you can just kind of suck it out of the ground because it's, it's fluid, so you can just kind of suck it out. So you know it's it's less engine, it's it's less it's like so it's less kind of um land intensive because you're not taking up a massive pit in the ground, but it's more engineering intensive because you have to drill down kind of very carefully and then kind of suck it out. So it is slightly more technically challenging, but you don't take up you know entire mountains to to get to it. And you can also have here what we show you in the picture is an offshore platform which allows you to drill out in the ocean under the sea floor in the ocean as well. Um, disasters happen from time to time. Either ships carrying oil can kind of crash and then spill all the oil into your beaches, or oil platforms like these can catch fire and spill a lot of oil into the water. So terrible things can and do happen from time to time. But that's the price of cheap energy, apparently. Uh, aside from the extraction, there's also the refining. This is a, is that a gas refinery or an oil refinery? I, that's an oil refinery. There's also gas refineries. So pulling the stuff out of the ground is not enough for it to be fuel because there's a, there's a lot of kind of stuff mixed in together. So what refineries do is they separate the different types of fuel. And uh, in a large, so these things are large complex industrial facilities as you can see in the picture. There's a lot of pipes, a lot of Fractioning columns is what they're called when they heat the the, the crude oil and then they they recapture them or they distill them at different temperatures along the column and at different temperatures the the, the gas and the liquids kind of uh, uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the the fluids turn from gas back into liquids at different temperatures and so they separate it out according to temperatures and so then you get kind of diesel and petrol and, and, other, and other kind of fuels, kerosene and so on and so forth. You separate all of that out into useful materials. Otherwise, you just have crude oil where everything is mixed together and it's not that useful for fuel. So these things are, are just kind of massive industrial complexes, usually mixed in the water because the gas and the oil is brought in via tanker ships. So they're often mixed in the water so the tankers can kind of just drop off the oil and they get process them here and then pipe them somewhere, pipe the, the product somewhere else. Um, yeah, massive, massive industrial complexes and they pro produce a bit of pollution as well. But again, the price of fuel, right? So that's our outline of infrastructure. Your exercise, exercise eight, is to build the roads. So the city currently does not have roads. Instead, it has paths that have been trampled into mud or soul sand, as it is in, in Minecraft. Your task is to build roads for the city. So what I've done is, instead of having actual roads there, I've put soul sand in. If you know Minecraft, then you'll know that soul sand, the effect of it is that when you walk on soul sand, you become slower. And I did that to simulate mud, because that's basically what happens when you don't have a road, is you keep kind of trampling the ground until it turns into mud and then everything is bad because you can't get anywhere easily. So that's what happens when you have a bad road or not enough roads. So your job is to build roads. Um, as you do so, give consideration to elements like street lights, street signs, trees, etc. Although note that you don't have that much space to work with, so you might not actually have very much room to put in a lot of street trees, for example. Notes that not all roads have to be the same. Consider different road types and materials depending on where they are. For example, 
you know, a main road might be different from a side road. You might have different materials, different kind of sizes of roads. Up to you. Um, optionally, also improve the port. So it's not really in that picture there, but at the bottom right, there's a there's a boat and there's a port there. So the port is also infrastructure. So if you want to, you can also improve that a little bit. Although there's not very much room for you to do very much, you can kind of add some decorative elements, I guess. Again, that's optional. So the exercise is to build roads. It won't be all that much fun, to be honest. I mean, I've I've built roads in Minecraft before. It's not the most exciting thing to do because it's it's just not fun. But it's important because infrastructure is important. So it's one of those things where, you know, you don't enjoy it, but you have to do it. Like sewage. You know, you don't, you, nobody enjoys sewage, but somebody has to deal with it. And here, you have to deal with the roads. So there you go. Those are the image licenses. And in the next video, I will be in Minecraft building roads. I will see you there.